Welcome everyone to the Vocal Revolution, where we talk about the power of voice to change our world, personally and collectively. And my guest today, Michael Harper, is an amazing singer, vocal consultant and singing teacher. He has sung opera, oratorio and new music in the US, Europe and in China, premiering new works in the UK, Venice and Geneva. As a vocal consultant, he has given masterclasses, workshops and lectures for numerous organisations, across the UK, Europe and the US, including the National Opera Studio, where he is a patron for the Diverse Voices programme, Westminster Choir College, Princeton, where he worked with the Grammy nominate Williamson Voices, and the British Library, where he held an Edison Fellowship and is a trustee of the Saga Trust. Michael has curated recitals for the London Song Festival and for Steinway Hall on the songs of African-American and Black British composers and directed a tribute to the Fisk Jubilee Singers as part of the Hull City of Culture in 2016. He teaches singing at the Royal Northern School of Music in Manchester and has private studios in London, Bristol and Oslo. And I was honoured to meet and work with Michael through Sing for Water, which is a project very dear to both our hearts and uh, it's been an honor to experience his incredible approach to voice so I'm sure wherever you are wherever you're tuning in you're going to get so much wisdom and insight about the power of voice from Michael today so thank you for listening and uh, welcome Michael thank you so much for coming to talk with us today thank you for having me thank you and you know I, I always like to hear the journey behind the biography, as it were, you know, you've, you've got a, a star studded list of achievements and accomplishments with your voice, but how did it all start for you? What was your journey? Well, I come from Virginia in the States and um, and when I was little, we sang in school, we sang at home and we sang at church. And I my my beginning was singing in church and I was singing a I guess it's a hymn for the beauty of the earth. That's the, my earliest memory of singing in front of people. And um, of course, we can, when we remember things, we can remember it falsely. So who knows if that's, but that's my first memory of it. So, um, uh, and it, I think it felt okay. I don't, I don't remember any horrible things about it. So I think it was a good experience. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And, um, and then I went on and I sang regularly in the choir at church and children's choirs and things like that. I don't think I thought anything of it. It just seemed a normal thing to me. And then when I was in the fourth grade, that was uh, nine years old, um, a teacher of mine must have heard me singing and suggested that I sing in an assembly in front of two, two separate assemblies, one in front of the fourth graders and one in front of the fifth graders. I was absolutely terrified. I, I didn't want to do it because I, I was very shy. And um, and she insisted, so I did. And I think again, once again, it felt okay. It wasn't traumatizing. It just felt uh, like something that you do. And um, so, um, and and then she became a mentor of mine, um, and would get me to sing at various events. Um, and then I joined. Uh, a gospel choir that my brother was in and it was an award-winning choir and we would tour the east coast and go to the gospel music workshop with james cleveland and sing there i never did that but i did tour with the choir and then we did recordings sometimes with pop stars and we had a sunday morning program where we would sing every week we had to go in and record it on thursday and then it would be a broadcast on sunday so every week we did this um so and I was in a program for the gifted and talented called Spotlight in my hometown in Petersburg. Um, and this was through the public schools. And it was a great, great program because you got a lot of really talented people together and, um, and we perform every summer. Um, so that would give us something to do in the summer. We would work, rehearse and rehearse and rehearse um, and, uh, and then perform in the summer and then perform for the schools. Um, at the beginning of the year as well. So it was really a fantastic training. 
And then I studied also theatre in, in the community theatre with a woman called Marie Manigo. And she's the same teacher that Blair Underwood, who was in L.A. Law, studied with. So he was um, in my school as well. I think he was a year below me, but we did uh, musicals together at, um, at school. So, so that's how it all started, really. Wow, 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 that's, it's amazing to hear your, your musical roots and, uh, you know, your mission, if you were to describe it around music, how, and voice, what would you say that is? Well, I would say that um, music for me was life-saving, life-changing, because I was what I would call a shy child and I think maybe shyness isn't necessarily a um, an innate condition but a conditioned condition if you will <laughs> yeah. it's a, something as a result of um, something being interrupted in a child's um, vivacity a child's um, liveliness and I think we had plenty of those things growing up that would stop us from being ourselves. And I think um, that singing really revived me um, and gave me uh, a way forward to being myself um, and helps me to reveal um, other people's selves for them, if, that, if, if you will. That makes absolute sense. And I'm sure many, many people can relate to that. And it's often, people are often surprised, aren't they? How many artists who seem very flamboyant and expressive on stage are actually very, very shy off stage. And um, it's like singing gives them permission to be who they really are in a different way on stage. And that is the one, one of the wonderful things that it allows us to share our authentic self. Um, and I also remember you telling me a story about dancing and how you also came into you know because I know your work is very body centered so how was how was that journey of, of finding an embodied voice for you yes so it's interesting because when I was a kid I was not considered the dancer in my family and everyone would um, would laugh at my dancing and I think I was very dyspraxic which is what we what we used to call clumsy you know I would fall over my feet I would fall over anything really and I and I still have those those uh, traits and people don't believe it because I'm quite dynamic with movement on stage and um, I see some of these pictures I have one in fact that a friend of yours took of me at Sing for Water in my red shirt I'm going who is that <laughs> because it doesn't it doesn't feel like me it doesn't look like me it's like this um, I don't know and this creature <laughs> uh, with this gesture, you know, this big gesture. And um, I was in graduate school and, uh, you know, I always believed myself not a mover, not a dancer, even though I'd taken dance classes and all of that sort of stuff. I always felt really, really clumsy in them. And um, it would take me extra time to learn how to do the movements. I had no idea how this worked. And so I was in graduate school and I was in a coaching with my teacher, Tibby Plyler. It's Sylvia Plyler, but we all we call her Tibby. Everyone in the South has a nickname except for me, by the way. Okay. <laughs> you were uh, always Michael then. <laughs> it's always Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, so Tibby, I said to Tibby, well, you know, she says, come on, I'll show, you know, dance, move. And I said, well, Tibby, I don't know how to dance. I'm not a dancer. I don't. She says, nonsense. Everybody can dance. Let me show you. And so she showed me and she showed me how to move and how to integrate movement into my body. I guess it's kind of eurythmics. Um, uh, there's another word for it as well. But you know how kinesthesia can actually release the body because that singing is movement as my Alexander teacher. Um, gosh, I'll think of her name soon, but she's quite a quite a well-known, Barbara Carnival said to us in Cincinnati, she said, you know, singing is movement. And um, if you're stuck, you know, if you're stuck, it's not singing, you know, it's not. Mm -hmm. So um, so if you think about so many parts are moving, even if you're standing completely still, there's movement in it. And so, so Tibby sort of started a revolution in my body for me because she, um, 
she just told me that I could. She told me that I could. And I think it was, you know, being given that permission to, um, yeah, I, I think that's what it is. It's being given permission. Uh, just as when people say, I can't sing, you know, I, you know, I give them permission. Not that they should need my permission, but sometimes that little person in us that's been interrupted by whatever it is. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's a trauma and sometimes it's just being told no. Mm. But all of those things are traumatic to the free inner child. And so, um, so Tibby gave me permission and she continued to give me permission, not by just telling me I could, but by showing me how. And I, so I think it's, it's all very good that sometimes singing teachers say, you can do this or do this, but if you don't know how to do it and it's really blocked in you, you need someone who knows how to show you how, how mm. to show you how. So my emphasis in singing is not to teach my singers how to sing, but to teach them how to learn. And if I can teach them how to learn, teach them a, a method of learning, then they can, they, they will find the singing. Right. They will find the singing. Teach them freedom in their bodies. They will find the singing. Because when someone's free, there's very little to tell them. There's very little to tell them. Yes. Because yes. all of those thoughts, all of those breaths, all of those movements are integrated. And yes. they flow. So if you're on flow, you're singing. Yeah, you might have to learn things about style. Mm. You don't have to learn about singing if you're if you're in flow. Yes. So it's that so there's the it's like the t giving people the technical know how the building blocks or the structure, isn't it? The form, but the actual liberation of a person. That's um, often where a lot of the work is going on, isn't it? Because, as you say, many of us were interrupted and um, had difficult experiences. I can really relate to what you said about dyspraxia because I was similarly falling off bikes and all sorts of things as a child. And um, so, you know, it was that that journey, but being going slowly through the process of being with different practitioners and body work. And, you know, when we get to really release what is held in our bodies and what is sort of we've held as in inhibiting factors or interruptions, as you called them, I like that word. And um, when we release those, then there is freedom, isn't there? There's freedom that comes. And there's layers, I think. Do you find that with your work, that there's layers of, of release of, in that process? For me, it's not always a, just an overnight thing. It's an ongoing journey of finding and recovering different parts of self. Would you say that's true for some of your singers? Absolutely. I think um, sometimes we have to go to places where in which we release something and things don't work anymore hmm. because we have habituated um, our singing in a tight way or in a held way and to release that means that that thing with which we're familiar doesn't work anymore yeah and so to let your jaw release or to let your head and neck release or to breathe before you sing or to let go before you sing all of those things will release you but it will also release your habits they will also release your habits and and because when when we get used to something we become comfortable and you know it becomes like another part of us that habit the holding the jaw tight or the wrinkling the brow all of those things seem to help us sing and they're actually not helping us they're just tightening and so when we start to release them it feels as though we're not doing anything and therefore it feels as though we're not singing anymore because we're not doing those things that are, have been habituated so i think it's uh so it's kind of a, a teaching people what not to do <laughs> really yes it's the un the undoing the undoing that is the teaching of singing i think really it's yes. the undoing and um of course with different styles with with operatic singing you need a different kind of physicality to the singing than if you're singing in a mic for pop music but for me it's the same thing 
no matter what kind of singing you're doing, you need good support and need good connection to the breath and a good connection to diction and all of those sort of things. Um, whatever kind of singing um, or diction you're using, you need to know because there are great people who do pop music and there are mediocre people who do pop music. And I don't think it's because um, those people are so different in ability, but because they're so different in um, degrees of freedom yes. to express themselves, if you will. Yes, um, absolutely. And th yeah, and then of course there are those voices that just resonate with everyone, like Pavarotti or Leontine Price or Aretha, or, you know, it depends on, on you know, who you're listening to. Um, you know, George Michael, whoever. I mean, those are just singers that I happen to like. But I even like Joe Cocker, who, to me, it's not a great voice, but he has some way of expressing that is, is great, that gets through, you know. So I think, um, yeah, it's degrees of freedom, I think, that um, of expression that makes someone great or not. And then, of course, the quality of the voice can be something that resonates with everyone. And who knows what that is? Who knows what that is? Yeah, there's something um, essential or something about a person's charisma or their essential personality that is coming through. As you say, Joe Cocker, or think of someone like Amy Winehouse, who, you know, yeah, exactly. incredibly traumatized in many ways yeah. and yet able to express herself in such a raw way that everyone felt her when she yeah, sang. Yeah. Exactly. I say, you know, I say she had three notes, but what great three notes they were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a, an expansive voice, was it? You know, she, a lot of it was damaged by, probably by abuse to her, you know, system. But what a great communicator. What a yes. great communicator. And so it's, it's that, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I think of Aretha coming out and singing, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman with, is it Carol? King, Carol King, yes. Carol yeah. King, who wrote it, and it was uh, Carol King was being honored at the Kennedy Center, and Carol King was going absolutely mad because Aretha had been, I think, uh, she'd been had cancer or something, or she was quite unwell when she, um, when she came out to do that, and what an extraordinary performance, probably one of the performances of her life, um, and that just shows you that I mean, and certainly she had many, many, many difficulties in her life, but yeah. perhaps the singing was the way that she was free. And um, she had certainly trained uh, um, at the feet of some great, great gospel singers. Um, so, um, I, and I say to people, you can have the ability, but you know, if you don't, I mean, she had all of that great training, listening to these people, traveling with her father, you know, have, singing with someone like James Cleveland, practicing with, with them you get all of this, you get the knowledge of what to do, mm. you know, but you can't make Aretha's voice. No. You can't make that voice. That was something that's, you know, part of her physical makeup and the vocal folds and how they come together and all that sort of stuff. You can't make that. But without the training that she had with those people, she wouldn't have been able to phrase as she does or play the piano as she did, you know, with all of that style, all of that style in her bones. So yes. it takes takes many, many things to 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 make a singer great, you know, really does. And also, I guess, a sense of connectedness to her legacy and her yeah. tradition and her ancestral line, because I think there's so many different levels of things that we are tapping into when we sing. And when we have the the backdrop of things you know those traditions of our lineage as well as our musical choices you know as our genres and our styles as and our personality there are just so many levels aren't there of, yes. of what singing actually is and what it calls on from within us and something I always feel it's something deeply ancient as well because it's so primal inside of us you know it's the only instrument that we have actually inside of us so it's kind of deeply instinctive and that's why those singers that we mentioned that are, are more raw and more able to just tap into that really primal voice as well as then also stylistically creating songs creating forms that are beautiful for people to experience there's just all that levels isn't it 
And that's why I think when we sing, there are all those levels engaging and there is that transformation that you talked of being possible, a person becoming more free. And that then I've seen transform parts of their lives, not just the singing. I mean, have you seen, I mean, I know you've seen many people transform or other examples you'd like to share of that? Yes, I mean, um, there have been many people who come to me for lessons who say, I can't sing, um, uh, but I'd like to learn. And, and oftentimes I find really beautiful voices in there but someone told them along the way that they couldn't sing. And, you know, I just did this program called Anyone Can Sing for Sky Arts uh, with this company called Factory Films. And um, I, th I think it was really wonderful that we, we agreed in the beginning that we didn't want a competitive kind of program where people were being, and I think they didn't have the intention to do that. Um, I think it was really about empowering people. Um, and I only wish that we could have taken everyone to do that, but there wasn't time and, uh, and we wouldn't have had the energy to do that either. I think that um, it goes back to that thing that I was saying earlier about freeing the person, freeing the physical, freeing the mind, freeing the breath from all of those things that people were told that they couldn't do, or all of those things that stopped people from being them, their true selves, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, and I think once those things are out of the way, then you can start getting to the physical things that allow the voice to work properly. Because even though you get all of those things out of the way, you still have to get the vocal folds to approximate, that is to come together. You still have to get the breath to, to do what it needs to do to make pitch. Um, and a lot of that is more and more freeing on freeing of the person on deeper, on deeper levels. So there are layers of like an onion skin um, of taking off the distress of being told you can't. And when I, um, when my students say I can't in my lesson, I open the door <laughs> and I say, okay, you get to say that one more time out the door and then it's not allowed in here. <laughs> so there, there's not much that I don't allow in, in the lesson, but that's one word that's not possible to use there. Wow. Because I think, um, because it's the word that actually did the initial damage. Yes. And um, so I, I, I don't allow it. Um, so, I mean, it is a very, um, it's as much a psychological as it is a physical journey to get out of that place of um, not inability, but lack of belief to belief in oneself and one's ability to do it. And then on top of that, what does it take? It takes a lot of hard work to be a really good singer. And I think people don't know that. They think, I mean, some people just do it naturally. It, nothing was interrupted for them. Or if stuff was interrupted in other parts of their life, their singing wasn't interrupted. So they just flow when it comes to singing. We don't know why. And, um, and others have to work at it. And then there are some voices that at a certain stage in their life are really lyrical, like you have lighter voices. When they're younger, their voices can work really, really well. And there are other voices which are really, really big. And it's a, you know, it takes a lot of energy to produce this voice, but it also takes a lot of maturity in the body to produce this voice. It takes muscles being mature and, um, and strong enough. And so dramatic voices in opera, for instance, take much longer to develop. Lower voices take longer to develop than higher voices. So, um, so it, um, it, all of that stuff is um, sometimes contingent on time. And then people are in a hurry for everything now. Yes, <laughs> yes. Everyone wants everything overnight, isn't it? Someone quoted Margaret Thatcher to me, and I'm not in the, in the habit of quoting Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she says, it seems to me, or something to this way, it seems to me that young people these days are 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 busy wanting to to 
be something. In my day, we all wanted to, we all wanted to, we all wanted to do something. <laughs> and so I think that's, um, that's quite, um, quite telling really. And I think it's, you must do something in order to be something, if that makes sense, with singing. That means you have to practice, you have to, in, in classical music, you have to learn languages, um, you have to study literature, you have to learn how to dance, you have to learn how to act and to be on stage, um, you have to learn how to, to stage deportment, all of that sort of stuff is required, even in pop music. I mean, look at the all of the Motown groups, you know, they were really, really well trained in in um, in stage deportment. It was part of their part of their their their, their training. And I think um, so th those are all of the things that are required once you get beyond the freeing stage. Yes. Um, it doesn't just happen overnight. No. You can't just be something all of a sudden, you know, like it was an X Factor or whatever. Uh, I think it was X Factor originally. And, and people imagine that those people just walked on that stage and they'd never sung before. And all of a sudden, wow, I can sing. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. No. It doesn't happen that way. And, you know, I, I, I reflect on the fact that I'm, you know, when I was singing with community choirs and singing this gospel piece, um, Give Me a Clean Heart by Doris... What's, I can't remember her last name, but um, anyway, it um, it's a song that I've known since I was a child, and you know I sing it, and people wonder why I can sing it. Well, because I've been singing it since I was you know ten or something. <laughs> so, yes. So um, so so it takes time for things to mature, for you to grow, and things get better and better if you keep working at it. But sometimes people think, oh, this is just a hobby and I'll just do it once a week when I go to Michael and um, and that's enough. But you don't grow that way. You grow yeah. by trying it out when you go home. And we always know, teachers always know. Um, and I tell my students, I said, you can't fool us because we've been doing this too long. <laughs> always know if you've been practicing or if you haven't because something's going to have changed by the time you come back. It may not be a major thing, but you will have a better understanding of it when you come back. And so when I mention this thing again, you can go, oh, yeah, I was trying that at home and I noticed that. And, and that's how you become a good singer. Yes. That's and how you become a good singer. It's, it's a lifelong process, isn't it? And a lifelong process of knowing yourself, getting to know yourself, getting to know your voice and then learning the, the technical know-how and all the different elements of what having a voice means if you're in whatever level and whatever genre you're going to be mm. taking on and that's uh, that's I suppose yeah I'd love to encourage people to understand that that it is a lifelong you know your voice is with you hopefully for all of your life so mm. from the beginning to the end so your relationship with it therefore is the same as your relationship to yourself and something that you have to continuously navigate and and nurture and because and, it's going to change it will change you know sometimes just due to whether you slept how you slept what you ate yesterday uh if you had a traumatic event or if you're really happy all these things can impact your voice it's not going to be the same every day so you've got to have that ongoing relationship with it i guess isn't it and creating that that's right positive relationship whereas you know a lot of people don't haven't got that conception because it was as you say often interrupted you know i think when we see children they've got a natural yeah. natural relationship to all parts of their voice and they will play and express themselves in every possible register and aspect of their voice just freely um but as adults we've kind of condensed it down into certain bandwidths that we have been told are certainly you know these are socially acceptable you know i often think about conversation and the bandwidth of conversation and the even the kind of the tones that we're allowed to use whereas you only ever go out of that perhaps if you laugh or you sneeze yes. um, but then the bandwidth is just here isn't it yeah. so um yeah. i mean i i remember hearing someone say to their child we don't scream and the child was in the garden i thought well, where do the children get to explore the heights and depths and breadth of their voice voices if not in the garden you know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to come back to that thing of um, 
yeah, of childhood and using the voice and, and go to the other end where we are older. And uh, for me as a countertenor, that comes sooner than other voice types um, on a professional level. Anyway, um, I still use my voice to teach, um, but because the voice becomes less reliable um, sometimes as you get older, it's not as pliant and, and responsive and, uh, and easygoing as it used to be. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'd love to have conversations with you know, many older singers and talk about this because you know so much more then, but the body and the voice won't do as much as they used to do for you. Yes. <laughs> And you need to have, you know, you want to have a conversation with them and say, look, I know all of this stuff now. Why would you do, why yeah. would you do all of the things I know? And so, so, I mean, I, I encourage all of my young students not to be frightened to do things because you're going to learn all the way through. You're going to learn by doing. And, you know, I was always very careful. I must wait until I'm ready. And you, you must wait until you're ready. That's true. But sometimes you need to take a chance and and do your practice, do your study, and and then quite not, and 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 perhaps not be ready emotionally yet for it, but try it anyway. Yes. You know, to just jump off the, you know, jump off the cliff and see if you fly. I don't That's mean right. that literally. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, there there are times though, isn't it, where you you have to take that risk because ready could take another what we conceive and it's whether it's our mental concept of what ready is yeah. because sometimes we've got something in our head that says I'm not ready but actually you do have the physical apparatus you do have the body the the voice is there to to be explored and it's wanting to be explored it's just our head that says oh no I need to do another six courses and I need to you know see another seven teachers and before I'm ready but that's the head thing often isn't it and it's actually just allowing ourselves, giving ourselves permission, that big word you said earlier, um, which comes up a lot in the podcast, giving ourselves permission to, 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 to play, to experiment as we did as a child, to just experiment, to jump off. We wouldn't have had, you know, a child doesn't think going down a slide, am I ready to go, woo, <laughs> you know, doesn't think that, just does it. <laughs> so, sometimes, you know. they need, sometimes they need encouragement because it looks a bit scary. Yeah. But once they do it, they go, oh, can I do that again? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, so, yeah, so I think it's that thing, uh, the difference between perfectionism, which is, which is, uh, which is an obsession yes. about getting it right. Opposed, as opposed to perfection, which is just completion. You know, so yeah. making something complete is different from being obsessed about getting it right. Yes. And and then I was going to go back to to, to being a child, and the, the 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 messages messages that children are given or young people are given about singing, or movement or drawing or whatever, <clears throat> or even being right um, or being able to do maths and <clears throat> being told no you don't do this you're better at this well why not try to teach them everything that they want to learn because that's truly teaching and that's why the system doesn't really work mm. for children it works for some people and, and that's because we don't really have time teachers are overloaded and they don't have time to actually yes. teach they have to administer children through a system. Yes. And so when it comes to doing a choir, they don't have time to say to little Jilly or Johnny or uh, Malika or whoever, uh, okay, so you're, you're not singing the right pitch. Let's see if we can get you to sing the right pitch. Yes. Rather than saying, oh, you stand in the back of the choir and move your mouth. Mm. Yeah. So I think some of that is just the teacher not knowing how to teach and mm. some of that is a system in which they are I mean it's insidious really because it yeah. doesn't really give people room to do it and then people are given messages uh, teachers are given messages like oh you can't sing teach singing unless you can play the piano 
Well, what a ridiculous thing, because singing came before piano even existed. Yes, <laughs> yes. Beating on rocks or beating things with rocks or with sticks came long before drum kits existed. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so do you really need, and, and people in, I hate this expression, in developing countries show this all the time. They're in, in gen, um, they, they're genius in the way that they, they find ways to make things happen without anything. Yes. The way they make music happen and they make festivals happen and they make costumes and things happen even with nothing, with nothing yeah. or so from our perspective as Western capitalist countries with nothing. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's it's really about being given permission, but also the people who give you permission, having the skills to help you get through if you don't really quite know how to do it. That's what teaching is. It's yes. drawing out of those, the qualities that are already there. And of course, some people are going to be better at it than others. Yes. Of course they are, because we just have natural ways of being different, really. Mm. It doesn't mean that everyone can't experience it and, and enjoy it. Absolutely. And it's the resources, like you say, it's what's already inside of us. And when you, yeah, you're talking about indigenous cultures and they're, they're, they're extremely well resourced in a different way. And the, as you say, Western capitalist might, um, outlook might judge that and say, well, they've got no money, they've got no this and that, bricks and mortar, whatever, no, no studios, whatever. But they're making, they are in touch with the fact that from the beginning of life, we are sound making beings and we are made of sound vibrations or there's vibrations in every part of us and there are ways to make sound and music with just our bodies and that's you know that's innate and then if you have the resources of nature around you that then amplifies it by a thousandfold because you've got sticks and wood and everything and trees and birds and everything to make music with so um and elements so um so that and that for me is that coming back to that um, that's when I've loved, when I've done any research, I've loved hearing that often in Indigenous traditions, there isn't a separation between the word singing and dancing. There often isn't uh, a separation between singing and the rest and the community's life, that it is actually completely interwoven into the fabric of the society. It's not like something we do and we go and see in a separate box and we perform and then we have an audience. It's just not like that. It's a completely interactive participatory experience that is part of serving the whole community as I've you know and that's what I think we we can forget sometimes and but yeah. we but I believe when we come back to it it becomes all of that and I think that's why some of the work I've seen in community choirs you get the sense that we're coming back to yeah. something we're bringing we're building an ecosystem again that we had naturally before actually yeah. we just forgot Exactly. I think that's exactly right. I think, um, well, with the church, you know, people, people who sang eventually became separate from those and you had to be able to read music. So they produced these scores and it produced very, very beautiful music, but it was nothing that the people could actually be directly involved with. So they had to listen. Whereas, you know, in pagan traditions, people sang and they danced. Um, and this is not advocating one over the other. I mean, that's up to people what they choose to do with their spiritual life. But it's just saying that they're sociologically, I think there was a separation of who got to sing. And of course, pagan traditions were um, eschewed as well by church and establishment so that you couldn't actually do those things. You know, and for instance, when African people were brought to the state, their their traditions were um, were um, actually oppressed, and so they could um, the the way that they could express them was through religious songs, through spirituals, so they and work songs. So they expressed them through that, and they carried their rhythms and their dance through that. And they still do their dances in church, in the more Pentecostal ones, who probably are closer to the African traditions than the than the more um, the more um, Protestant. Um, um, uh, um, how, how do I say this? High church ones. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes, and and sorry, yes. You no, know I was going to say, and also, I mean, they were, 
the the bits that the church and the established wanted to commandeer from those so that they could have people buy into their into their paradigm you know they do that all the time the catholic church does that all the time in south america you have a madonna del something or another that connects into a community um, pagan tradition you know so you have that all in africa as well you have that all over the world so they were very clever in taking the bits that would draw people in but suppressing the bits that i guess made people joyful really <laughs> and empowered as well and because and empowered and empowered that's yeah. exactly right so um that's right and you know a lot of even in the bible there were traditions uh, of, of women in power but those were all suppressed when the bible was put together you know so um yes so i think i think all of those things are true in singing we we find a way of you know you go to english churches sometimes and i'm sure people must have sung before but everyone now sings in a very kind of tight way as if they don't want their voices to be heard and i find it very and i think there's one thing that maybe they're starting to understand that if you put things in keys that people in which people can sing then they'll sing yeah. but if you put them in a key for uh, a boy chorister which is much higher which is a much higher key then of course people are going to be straining at the top of their larynx on sunday morning to sing this they're not really quite um, warmed up and they have to sing in the stratosphere so i think some some of that maybe is changing but then people aren't going to those places where we did communal communal singing anymore because they're right. questioning all of those traditions so so it's interesting the way singing is going and i think more of the community the community choir is is kind of opening up um things for people to sing again which is nice it is lovely it's important it's really important and it's important that as you say there's been a huge amount of colonization and assimilation of mm. traditions um and i know one of your missions is to help uh, preserve african-american and black british tradition and i know you've just been involved in creating a, a very special prize and an award do you want to say a bit more about that because yes. and what that means yeah yes so when i was in graduate school one of my professors um, who was teaching me 20th century uh, music history i said so now that we're in 20th century music history are we going to um, talk about more women composers and more black composers and he said to me, well, you know, we're mainly concerned with legit music. We're not going to, <laughs> people always, their jaws drop when I tell them, we're mainly concerned with legit music. We're not going to be talking about jazz and that sort of thing. Oh. So it showed me, uh, well, quite a few things, but I'll name a few. It sh showed me the fact that he didn't think that anything that was created by women and black composers was legitimate. Um, and jazz can be sometimes far more complex than classical music and is now considered a kind of classical music. Um, and, you know, and certainly they were using some of the same techniques as modern classical composers, you know, even going beyond. Um, and, um, but not only that, that he didn't know anything about women composers because he wasn't required to know anything about women composers mm. he didn't know anything about african-american or other african heritage composers around the world and you know now that i know more because i've done study of them and you know i'm far from an expert but i'm learning as i go um, now that i know more i know that he didn't know anything about these things because he wasn't required to know and it wasn't required that it had to be part of the curriculum you know, even reading this book, um, this art, music of Western, uh, history of Western music by uh, Donald J. Grout, um, you know, these people had certain I ideals, they had certain ideas and certain ideals, and I didn't fit anywhere in that, and you didn't fit anywhere in that. And so therefore, they weren't required to know, and they weren't required to teach us any of this. And so therefore, I grew up not knowing very much of what we had contributed to 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 western music and so my aim um by setting up this scholarship at the, the this competition at the royal northern college of music 
And I suppose I set up the competition because it, it gives people money and they have to learn the music and they have to learn it to a certain level um, of qu uh, quality level in order to actually do it. So it's not just something that they can just sort of say, oh yeah, I'm going to get some money, I'm going to get a scholarship. Now you have to go and do the work. And, um, and so it, it, it's, it's called the Williams Howard um, Competi uh, uh, Memorial Prize. And it's named after my grandfather, Chester Ambrose William Sr. <laughs> and my, my fourth grade teacher that I told you about, Helen Palmer Howard, um, because they were both really influential in my young life and really sort of allowed me space to be me. Yes. And, um, or taught me things, you know, like my grandfather was a gardener and he was very pre precise about things. And, uh, and stop a bit stubborn and uh, <laughs> like me <laughs> and so you know he lives with me now and I, my poor students you know I'm very precise about things and so, <laughs> um, you know and Helen just you know she took me to my lessons and taught me you know she 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 paid for my lessons and um, and all of that sort of stuff she 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 allowed me to grow and and encouraged me to be a leader and encouraged me to meet people and so, so this prize um, is once a year, and the, the, the point of it is to, to, to encourage the study and performance of art songs by African heritage composers. And some people say, well, why should you just do that? And I said, well, their prize is to encourage the study and performance of French music, of German music, loads and loads of them, you yes. know, all sorts of European music, but nobody sees that as ghettoization no but only when you mention something that's of african heritage they see it as a ghettoization which is a term that was applied to us as it was applied to jewish people you wow. know so, you know so it's so so i don't really care anymore mm. and i think i have support at the at the college as well which is wonderful yes um, and so so what happens is that people so eventually people will, will just get to see that this is music and that what I'm presenting to them is quality music. And of course, there are going to be varying levels of quality as there are in Western European music yes. or Eastern European music or any of kind of music in the world. And um, so my point is to get people to study it and find those varying levels. And sometimes you think something might not be good. So just the mention of um, African heritage because of all of the things associated with blackness and African heritage in our culture means that it's considered a lesser quality. And then when people hear it, they go, wow, that's a great piece of music. That's my point. And, um, and you know, also I'm uh, working to set up a repository at the Royal Northern College of Music of, of this music and um, scores of this music and um, and of um, related materials, so that it can be an uh, uh, an international source, but set certainly a European source for this music if someone is looking for it. So it can be a study center for this sort of thing. So so that's that's what I'm doing, and it's because because I was told that. And when people tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how tenacious. I mean, I'm very, I'm very sort of modest and held back about these things sometimes, but I'm very tenacious and very, um, yeah, and very stubborn about moving ahead with the things I want. And sometimes it takes me a long time, but I'm also, you know, I'm very patient about these things um, and I will just keep going. So, so that's, that's what I'm doing. And I, I don't think it's, I mean, you know, someone said, you know, it's really important the work that you're doing, Michael. I mean, there are other people who are doing this work and who have been doing it much longer, but um, but I'm trying to do it here in the way that in the way that I can with my life and my experience. I'm, Absolutely, I'm and we're all part, I believe, of a movement, aren't we? At this, yeah. that's yeah. how I see it. We're all part of a movement of um, reclaiming uh, musics and music and, and composers, as you say, female composers, black composers, pe uh, people whose voices have been excluded from the mainstream and considered to be lesser than and mm. not music. This is complete That's nonsense, right. as we know, but from the white canon 
um, mm. we are now busting that out open um, as exploding much. Exploding the cat, exploding <laughs> the cat. <laughs> Yeah, that's and that's what and, and bless the spirit of, of both you and your grandfather for being tenacious and stubborn about that, because that's what we need. That is what is needed, because there will be enormous amounts of no's. There will be enormous amounts of oppression that we have to work through, whether that's very subtle levels or very overt levels, such as you experienced with um, the, the person that said that. And in a way, those people can become if we use them that way, they're almost like the forge that we fire ourselves off. That no, it's like, well, you know, I we do it anyway. We do it anyway, and we will reclaim those voices. And that's why this is so this is profoundly important work. And we, as you say, we do it from our corner where we can, in the way that we can. And um, but we're part of a bigger movement and a bigger legacy and of celebrating what was always there. You know, it's not like women and black people just weren't there. They weren't doing anything. Do you know what I mean? For thousands of years, everyone was there doing things. It just didn't happen to get the mouthpiece or the, the celebration that what white white men were doing. So um, so that's where we're, you know, this stuff has always been there. And yeah. we, you know. And I, I think that, you know, I think that to be clear for myself, I don't think that there was any active um, viciousness or active prejudice there it's just it's just the way it was and the way and what people were required to do mm. and um, they were required to study Beethoven and Bach and Mozart and Mendelssohn yes. you know and Shostakovich and things like that and those things were considered valid and though the way those men made music was considered valid and anything else was just, you know, second rate, or it wasn't considered important, um, or it was considered derivative. And and yet, you know, Gershwin was taking, you know, black music, uh, Ten Pan Alley was taking black music and using it, and they were considered innovative, innovative. All of these, you know, you know, Ravel, all of these, uh, you know, European composers were you know, Steve Reich took all of these African ry rhythms and, you know, he was part of the minimalist movement and he was considered innovative. But, you know, African people had been, he, he wrote them down, but they've been making these rhythms for, for ages. You know, if you think about Indian music and the tabla player, I mean, extraordinary stuff, extraordinary stuff. And the Beatles brought them, to, I think it was the Beatles, or was it the Rolling Stones? Who was it? The... Who was it? Was it George Harrison? I think it was the Beatles and George Harrison out. who particularly yeah, Harvey, celebrated Harvey Krishna. Harvey, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so they brought, you know, this music to the light of the Western world. And and yet, you know, that had been existing for thousands of years, you know, so, um, and it is extraordinary, you know, when I think about my Indian colleagues and how they learn a piece of music, I'm like, how, how do you, that is, I mean, how, how are you doing that? I don't understand what you're doing. And yes. they're counting on every knuckle of their, of their finger, you know, every joint of the finger. And I'm going, what are you, what are you doing there? Because it is extraordinary. And, and, um, and when you think about what we do is so basic in comparison. Yes, yes. <laughs> completely. And yes, the Indian scale I mean, has microtones and all exactly. sorts of, exactly. it's extraordinary. And the rigorous, the training, my, my friends exactly. that play tableau are playing eight hours a day, you know, that so um, it's not something you just, yeah, it's and then they sit there and it's almost casual, you know, it's not yeah. like, <laughs> it's, yes. it is wonderful because it is part of, you know, we remember learning ragas and you have to do them over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so it's interesting because I think even in classical music and singing, for instance, that used to be the way that it was, that you go to a teacher, you, I guess people, even if they were great singers, they would live with the teacher or live in the same area as the teacher and go every day or go yes. more often than once a week, that is. And, um, so I think, uh, yeah, it is, it is extraordinary the, the ways that other people learn music and the hypnotic effect of some of that, you know, that, um, that learning and the, 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 and production of music, really. So, yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and as you said, you know, the exclusion is not necessarily 
malicious, but it's just been learnt. It's a learnt thing. It's a learnt thing that's been institutionalised over centuries. So nobody living now invented that. But we have now this moment to widen that out, to become more inclusive and to celebrate all the traditions that have coexisted for, for centuries. And to, 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 they don't need validating by us because they're already there, but it's just about them having the same amount of celebration and weight, given the same amount of weight, let's say. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of resistance still um, to, to what I do and to, to opening up. Um, and a lot of teachers don't see that there's any point in them doing it because of the, the orchestras and the opera houses are expecting them to learn this. Why should they venture into learning something else that's not going to be useful to them as a career? Wow. And I say because we should be teaching the, the fullness, the complete music history. We should, you know, I told some kids in a, in a class that I was teaching, I said, do you know who this is? I said, well, this was a very important person. They were very innovative. They were this, you know, like Harry T. Burley, who was one of the top yes. American, American um, uh, art song composers at the turn of the century. And I said, if you don't know who they are, then somebody's cheating. You've gotten an incomplete education. You should ask for your money back. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I think they should be learning the truth and not just partial truth. Yeah. And, yes. and you know, it's, it's like saying that European history wasn't influenced by African history or by Asian history. I mean, don't be ridiculous. And people actually learned that. They believe that everything started with the Greeks and from there on, that's, you know, maybe that is the beginning of Western European, but ain't the beginning of the world. And I think that, we, you know, that's, that's what I mean, is that we learned everything from the point of view of Europe, 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 not that there were great civilizations that existed before that. That's right. That's and right. Egypt, because we thought that that was something special or Greek because Greece because we thought that was something special but not any of the great African kingdoms or you know none of that was important or explored that's right so it's just it's it's kind of um, me before I die making sure there's a little bit more information in the world um, about what is rather than what is pretended to be Thank you, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for the legacy of that, because that's an that's an extraordinary legacy to and a gift um, that you're giving to to the world, you know. And so, thank you for doing that, because it's really, really, really important. And it's really important that we hear those stories, we hear those voices, and we hear the truth, as you say, the truth, not just the partial truth, but you know, there are so many more, you know, even around language, which they. You know, there's so many things back in the beginning of our our vocal history, let's say, right back in the day, so many things that we can't trace because you can't make fossils of voices. But, mm. you know, at the same time, they, they find more and more things now, even language which they thought started in the Middle East. No, they found it on eggshells, ostrich shells in Africa now, you know, and so <laughs> all these things, you know, it's it's coming to light now that this, you know, we can't pretend anymore. We have to be honest yeah. about where all of our origins came from and that we are, you know, we are a global community. Therefore we have always, there has been traditions all over this world that are equally and extraordinarily beautiful and powerful and need to be heard and celebrated. So, and voices. And I think, I think um, as, as we come to an end, I think it's, important to remember that there are always oppressive forces in the world mm -hmm. and those oppressive forces want to suppress this information they want to suppress this opening up and that we must always be vigilant to find a way to take opening up forward i mean i think of the morano jews in 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 spain when they were forced to turn uh to 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 um um convert to Christianity. They carried on in little rooms, hidden rooms in their houses, carrying on their tradition because they felt that was important. 
And, uh, and, you know, it was quite a curious thing because they carried on their tradition while pretending to be what they needed to be to survive. And so I think um, we need to remember to carry on with this even if there is an oppressive force trying to keep it. And I think that's how African people did it in the States. They carried on and they continue to carry on with all of the oppressive forces against them. And women do with all the, they carry on, you know. So I think, um, and I think it's it's also important to remember not to, to blame people because sometimes mm. people are just doing what feels safe for them. Yes. Um, but to be clear about who's that and who's being oppressive. Yes. And important to remind people that also, if they are resistant to things, they are being oppressive. If they are, if they are colluding with things rather than looking for ways of opening them up, they're being oppressive. Mm. So, um, and and it's the same thing of oppressing our voices. You know, telling children no, mm. telling children you can't. You know, it's the same thing. It doesn't allow people to flow and be free. And I encourage all of my students, no matter what their background is, to be themselves. Yes. My, my aunt Count used to say, be yourself, child. <laughs> 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 and I love it. And I just tell them, be yourself, child. Be yeah. yourself. Be yourself. And that is, that's a wonderful, um, you know, message for all of us. Be yourself and know that there are ways, just as you say, that, you know, even when people have been forced into very oppressive conditions, you know, such as I was just thinking of the spirituals again and how so many with spirituals were coded messages, weren't they? So even within the, you know, within the the having to fit themselves into what was acceptable within a Christian sort of tradition, but there were still coded messages about escaping or getting to the Underground Railroad and to getting out of slavery within the singing, which was that then the singing itself was a form of rebellion in itself, which they had to use and that's I think where singing becomes this form of can become this form of rebellion and of reclaiming ourselves and being ourselves even in the midst of oppressive situations so, mm -hmm. so thank you for yeah. helping us uh, become free Michael <laughs> I, I, that's probably given me a bit too much credit I think people help themselves to become free by making the choice yes I, I'm only I'm only there to guide them I think we all know exactly what we need to do and teachers are just there to guide you and to keep reminding you to keep doing that thing. Thank you for the stand that you are then for people's freedom. Maybe that's more of a correct way of saying it, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's important because not everyone is in that place, you know, and that is important because yes. if we can all be a stand for each other's freedom, then we become, we, we become, as I said, part of a movement, part of a community, part of a wider we're not alone when we're not oppressed by being isolated. We are, we are together in that movement to try and bring more freedom, more liberation, more vo voice, more truth. Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. And is there anything you would like to invite people to as we close or anywhere they can find you if they want um, to? Yeah, I mean, they can just go on my website or go on the Royal Northern College of Music's website if they need to get in touch with me. Um, uh, it's very easy. Just look me up, Michael Harper, countertenor, if you want to get in touch, or um, uh, or write to me at the Royal Northern College of Music. And uh, yeah, fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'm doing various things. Um, um, uh, Nadine Benjamin. Uh, this isn't until um, until February next year, but we're doing a concert at the Barbican on art songs by. Uh, and have to composers so, um, so that's um, looking forward to that but you know I'm doing various little things in between but mostly teaching related at the moment fantastic and, 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 re and doing research so great well I'll make sure we put the links in in all the information so yeah so you people can get in touch with Michael and follow what he's doing and look forward to hearing more about that amazing performance next year and good luck with all the preparations for that and all your amazing teaching and thank you again for coming to talk to us today. Yes, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, uh, Katie.
And thank you everyone for listening and tuning in and I hope that you've enjoyed that as much as I have and feel really enriched and have lots to take away and feel free to leave us a comment or drop me a line about how you felt about that. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much everyone for tuning in. Thank you again, Michael Harper and uh, wishing everyone much truthful, free, beautiful expression of their voices. Thank you so much. <laughs>